Good evening. I'm Michael Issa, President and CEO of KQED. I hope you and all of your loved ones are healthy and safe. Welcome to the special live stream event celebrating 25 years of the California Report, a quarter of a century covering the places and the people, the issues and the dreams, the events and the experiences that make our Golden State so unique. Tonight, Daily Morning Show hosts Lily Jamali and Saul Gonzalez, plus longtime California Report magazine host Sasha Coca will take all of us on a retrospective of our vivid coverage, the stories that have moved all of us intellectually and emotionally. But before they join us, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that it has been an extremely difficult year for all of us. A long stretch of stress, anxiety, uncertainty, and loss. At times, I know, it's been hard to find what there is to be thankful for, but this is exactly when we need gratitude the most. So, I want to extend my personal appreciation first to all of you. Thank you for sharing your time with us for this event. Time is the most precious thing that we have. Additionally, I want to thank KQED's dedicated listeners, our viewers, our readers, those of you who regularly participate in our events, and especially if you support us financially. However you show your support for KQED and the California Report, your belief in our work is inspiring. We're also very grateful for the critical loyal support of our funders. The California Report has become an enduring and vital chronicle of our state because of the James Irvine Foundation. They have been with us from the very beginning. They made the first grant to launch our series. And our appreciation to Eric and Wendy Schmidt, who believe in the power of quality journalism and whose ongoing generous support helps make the California Report accessible to communities across the state. And thank you to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco for specifically supporting this evening's celebratory virtual event. You know, ultimately the California Report is about the people, the people behind the circumstances shaping our everyday lives. And I want to recognize and thank the people behind the scenes at KQED who are passionately dedicated to informing, inspiring, and involving our audiences statewide. There have been so many people involved throughout the years from the series' founding mothers, producer Sally Isley, director Tammy Ray Scott, engineer Seal Muller, and host Maya Krejci, to all the audio technicians, producers, and contributors who've left their marks on the series and have gone on to great things, and to our hosts who've served as trusted guides through California's past and present. So with that, on behalf of the California Report and KQED. Please know that we understand just how privileged we are to serve our audiences in a moment when the safety of our citizens and the health of our democracy are at stake, and in a time when so many forces are driving us apart. We also feel the yearning for integrity, inclusion, belonging, and personal connection. Simply, we take the responsibility to serve you with trusted information and quality storytelling very seriously. So, without further ado, the California Report's 25th anniversary event. This is the California Report. I'm David Wright. I'm Scott Schaefer. I'm Penny Nelson. I'm Rachel Myra. I'm Queenie Kim. I'm John Sepulveda. I'm Lily Jamali. I'm Saul Gonzalez. And I'm Sasha Coca. Being at Lake Tahoe, that's Sierra the, Nevada. Uh, the Imperial Valley. Oh, the Jerry Garcia Memorial Elevator. To San Diego. Of San Francisco. On the Long Beach route. In Butte County. Coming to Fresno. Los Angeles County. To Auburn Dam. Uh, to Livermore. Los Angeles. Monterey. Sacramento. The city of Carson. This is Southern California, sunny. To Santa Paula. Shasta Dam. In Santa Cruz. The Bakersfield. Uh, Yosemite. As far as California is concerned, this is like the best. We're the California Report for those only in California stories.
Hello, my name is Anai and this is my dad Juan and we are very excited to be a part of the California Report 25th anniversary celebration. Um, I was born and raised in the Central Valley and I spent my whole life pretty much playing and singing mariachi music. And music was always a really big part of my identity and it really allowed me to connect to my community both through performance and also through teaching. When I um, moved to Boston for college, I very quickly got super homesick. And I didn't only miss the sun and the scenery, but I missed the people. And the California, the California report really allowed me to stay connected to that part of my identity, even though I was 3,000 miles away. Um, I would live vicariously through all the stories I would read on the report. Uh, so to celebrate the 25th anniversary, um, I'm going to be performing a song that my dad wrote about California's farm working community called Corrido de las Heladas, and I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> Este corrido, señores, lo canto con sentimiento para expresar la amargura y la tristeza que siento de ver a mis campesinos con este gran sufrimiento. Lo que sucedió en el valle nunca en la vida sucede. El 25 de enero del año 99, Diosito nos ha mandado una tormenta de nieve. Las huertas se congelaron y el agua quedó hecha hielo. Patrones y pescadores todos están sin consuelo, con lágrimas en los ojos, miran la fruta en el suelo. Nuestros hermanos del valle, luego nos ayudaron. y comida para los necesitados que Dios les pague con creces lo que por su pueblo han dado aunque me vean de mariachi yo sé trabajar de todo pero el dolor de mi raza yo muy a pecho lo tomo mi madre es empacadora y mi padre es mayordomo. Vuela, vuela, palomita, párate en aquel naranjo. Ve y dile a don César Chávez que ya no riegue su llanto, que el valle ha sobrevivido estas heladas del campo. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sasha Coca. I'm the host of the California Reports weekly magazine program, and it's so wonderful to have you here for this celebration of our 25th anniversary. That amazing opening song that we just heard was Ana y Adina and her dad, Juan Morales. And we first brought you their story on the California Report last year when Ana y was a young mariachi from the town of Delano in the Central Valley, and she was heading to study at Harvard. Tonight, we are celebrating 25 years of the California Report. It's hard to believe, but it's almost a quarter century of telling stories about the people and places of the Golden State. We don't just give people the news they need to know, but we also try to connect us to each other through stories that make us feel something. And I gotta say, we love connecting with our audience. And unfortunately, we can't do that in a real space right now, but we're gonna try the best we can to do it virtually. 
And if you're tuning in from across the state, we'd love it if while you kick back and have your dinner or enjoy your cocktail during the show, you can participate in the chat with your questions, your discussion. Uh, we've also got some trivia, whether you're watching on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook, be sure to check out the chat. I'm joined tonight by Lily Jamali and Sal Gonzalez, who are co-hosts of the California Report's daily morning news program. Thanks, Sasha. Now, when we began planning for our show's 25th anniversary, anniversary, somebody remembered a San Francisco Examiner article from 1995. It was our show's very first year on the air, and the newspaper's description really set the scene for an average day in our studio in San Francisco, capturing the California Report's energy and, more importantly, its mission. So let's go back in time to 1995. Here's how the examiner set the scene in that article. And I quote, inside a glass paneled studio, host Maya Krejci is going over her copy one last time, reading aloud and bobbing her head to the rhythm of the words. Sally Isley, watching intently from the control room, is swinging her left leg from her tabletop perch, while Seal Muller is whittling 10 seconds out of an interview on a big reel-to-reel -reel audio tape. The show is about to start. Welcome to the premiere edition of the California Report. I'm Maya Krejci. It's been amusing for me to watch white America realize what black America has known all along, that sometimes justice may or may, may not be done. I mean, with us, our history is that justice ain't done. On today's show, a conversation with four Californians about the O.J. Simpson case, an American event that revealed and maybe widened the gaps dividing the races in this country. Also, an interview with Ross Perot, Los Angeles Healthcare still in crisis, and the anniversary of Operation Gatekeeper on our southern border. But first, these news headlines. I just got to jump in and say here, this is me talking now in 2020 before we flash back to 1995. I've got to give a shout out to the almost all women crew that started this show. Of course, Raul Ramirez was our news director, but other than him, all the rest were women. KQED's former general manager and vice president, Joanne Wallace, who I know is tuning in tonight, Mary Bitter who was the president and CEO of KQED at the time, Charlene Harvey, who was KQED's board chair at the time. They all championed this idea of having a statewide service that became the California Report. And of course, you've heard the name Engineer Seal Muller. She was mentioned throughout the top of the show, and she is still with us at the controls after 25 years on the California Report. Love that picture of Seal. You know, the article that we've been talking about from the San Francisco Examiner all those years ago really summed up the show's mission, which hasn't changed 25 years later. And one final passage that I wanted to share with everyone really continues to describe what we are doing even today. So here goes. With its sprawling territory, climatic and cultural extremes, and teeming and diverse population, California is tough to cover. Yet, KQED journalists joined by reporters at public radio stations statewide have set no less a task for themselves than covering it all and even bringing Californians together in harmony. I don't know about the harmony part, but I do know this and I say this all the time. <laughs> Covering California is not easy to do. After all, area-wise, we're larger than the United Kingdom. When it comes to our numbers, there are more Californians than Canadians. Sorry, Canada. And then there's our racial, cultural, and linguistic, just the, the, the spectrum of people who are in this state. It really is like covering an entire country and not just a state. Lily? Yeah, a quarter century later, that is still what we are trying to do. The California Report has grown, as a lot of you know, from a twice-weekly uh, show to a daily news program. And we have, of course, the weekend magazine show featuring long-form stories and documentaries. We are carried on stations from San Diego to the Oregon border, and we're even in Nevada, believe it or not. And this evening, we want to share a little bit about how the California Report has done this and keeps on doing it, and all the amazing Californians we've met along the way. Sorry. 
dancing, it consists of footwork, something like Michael Jackson, a little bit, a little slipping and sliding, pantomiming, acting out a story. It's mainly men. Actually, this is the first all-women's battle that I've come to. You know, sometimes you gotta fight for your spot to get in the battle. I'm not saying that we, we are underdogs all the time, but you know, you just have to fight for your shine. And here, we, hey, it's, it's our time. One of the things that I think helps people come to Judaism in this kind of a context is that, that they are not damned forever, despite the fact that some of them have done damnable things, and that there is room for contrition and repentance and um, redemption. So that right. in and of itself, right. taking that as a caveat, that it's not to die for this. To right. live is the thing that God wants us to do. Right. And these commandments are so we can live and not so we can right. die. Right. Buenos días. ¿Cómo se secan aquí nada más en el papel? Sí. Ya para la tarde ya está cocido. Many people working the fields can't afford or access the produce that grows all around them, especially people in rural towns like Raisin City, where Jessica Ortiz lives with her husband and five kids. Raisin City is 25 minutes out of Fresno. It's a little town, little community, very quiet. We have a whole lot of vineyards around us. Most people that live in Raisin City work either picking grapes, picking peaches, doing the almonds. And that's what my husband does. He's out there picking for almost the whole world. And I mean, he only brings like so much money home to feed his own family. My electricity came up to almost $300. My water's 140. And with him just making $170, a week, it's pretty hard. I like the passion that it has and that you don't have to play quietly, you can play as loud as you want. Eighty percent of these kids are Mexicans. It's a very important part of the tradition. All the Mexican families, this is why they hear, they go to the plaza, they go to church and they hear mariachi. These kids, they kind of know what is mariachi, but they don't realize that they know. They have a lot of connection with mariachi. My mom was born in Mexico and my dad, so they like to hear mariachi music. And when they hear it, we start dancing.
Sarah Blasees, My Life and Other Natural Disasters by Anna Berlowitz. I write this book for the young generation, hoping you can be heard and understood no matter what voice you use. Anna's my sister. We grew up together in San Francisco. How do you deal with the frustration of sometimes not being understood? I have to be patient. You have to be patient. Yeah. If I don't have access to my communication device, it is depressing because I have no way to voice my opinions. I think that able-bodied people take their abilities for granted. It's so important to be heard. Can you hear me? And that last piece by our colleague Victoria Malleon aired not long after I joined the team. It is such a memorable story. It brings out so much humanity. And I think it really speaks to how at the California Report, sometimes we get personal in order to connect with our audience. Tonight, we're gonna hear about some of the history of our show. And we're gonna be hearing from some of our longtime contributors, contributors, including some alums who have gone on to become big stars at NPR and at other places. And for me, coming to the show, one of the highlights was the chance to get to work with someone who I had heard on the California Report for years as a fan. Sasha has been on the show for 16 years. She hosts our weekly magazine show. But she started as Central Valley Bureau Chief based in Fresno. And Sasha, I thought we could start our conversation by just having you tell us about the decision to open a bureau in Fresno in the first place. Really, that's so nice of you to say about being my fan. That's really kind. It's true. Um, but yeah, I think I think the founders of the show from the very beginning had a vision of covering California without just a coastal sensibility, really understanding that we have this huge inland swath and that, you know, even though that for people in the cities in L.A. and San Francisco, the Central Valley may just be drive by country, a place that you speed through on the I-5 or the 99 there's actually a lot of rich, rich storytelling there. There's incredible uh, immigrant communities there. And of course, you know, it does have some of the starkest poverty in the nation. It's also our nation's breadbasket. It's where most of the fruits and vegetables in the nation come from. And I think, you know, uh, we felt it was very important from the beginning to have somebody on the ground there, not just somebody who was parachuting in, but somebody who lived there, who was part of the community and who could tell stories from there. Yeah. Um, at this point, I actually want to encourage folks in the audience who are watching us, um, please submit questions if you have them for any of us. Um, we're going to try to incorporate some of them in our Q&As with one another. So make sure to do that. Um, Sasha, you spent 12 years in Fresno. Um, I know it's hard to boil 12 years down into just a couple of minutes, but tell us about some of the stories that you did there and what sticks with you. I think the backbone of my coverage was really covering farm workers um, and, of course, you know, pesticide exposure, a lot of really hard stories. I remember one story I did pretty early on was uh, about the death of a young teenage farm worker named Maria Isabel Jimenez. Uh, she died of heat exhaustion in a vineyard. She was pregnant and I went on a march with other farm workers who marched 50 miles uh, to Sacramento to protest conditions for farm workers working in the heat. Um, but you know, it wasn't all just depressing stories. There are also incredible arts and culture stories from the Valley. I mean, Fresno itself is home to some 99 languages, a very rich Hmong community. Um, and for me, I think one of the highlights of the beat was also that I was pretty much the only public radio reporter at the time who could claim that Yosemite and Sequoia Kings Canyon were on my beat. So I got to, you know, climb a shrinking glacier. I got to go spelunking into a cave to look for blind spiders. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, 
just to get serious for a moment, um, one of the most memorable and in impactful stories that you did while in Fresno was a collaboration with PBS Frontline and the Center for Investigative Reporting. It was called Rape on the Night Shift. Talk to us about how you got started on that story. Well, the story really started actually with a case in Bakersfield where some janitors came forward and said that the price they had to pay to get or keep their jobs was something really chilling. It was sexual harassment or assault at the hands of their supervisors in these buildings, these dark buildings alone at night when they were cleaning. Um, and so we spun that out into a full-fledged investigation. It took us about 18 months and we did a film for Frontline and, and a radio series for the California Report and for Reveal. And I'm really proud to say that our reporting actually led to legislative change. Um, here in California, bills were introduced that you know now provide more protections for janitors on the night shift. And, you know, Lily, even though I worked on a lot of really heavy stories, you know, I tried to find a balance and also tried to find hopeful stories, stories about people working, trying to make change. Uh, and I want to play just a little clip from a story about an, an inspiring woman whose who's tale still sticks with me. She is in Tulare County, which has some of the highest rates of hunger in the state. But the food bank does have the support of a group of community volunteers led by Sara Ramirez and her husband, David Terrell. They rescue produce that would otherwise rot in people's backyards. We found that there was a lot of tree fruit going unharvested. And yet at the same time, we have hunger and food insecurity. And it just seemed like we should be able to put a need with the surplus. Let's put the pieces together. This project to salvage fruit or glean it is part of a broader grassroots effort they fund out of their own pockets. The daughter of farm workers, Ramirez grew up in Pixley and went on to earn a doctorate at Stanford. She also served as Tulare County's epidemiologist and is a health educator. One of the biggest problems given that I was looking at health data was really these chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, juxtaposed with food insecurity. But we kept sitting around these tables and repeating the same thing over and over again. And there was little action. We were looking for someone else to do that work. Sarah's frustration just continued to build up and build up until she finally just said, you know what, I have to do something. Our team member said that I should be wearing a t-shirt that says, yes, I have a PhD and I pick fruit. She could do anything she wanted with her life. And what she's chosen to do is go back to her hometown of Pixley. There is extreme unemployment and not a lot of hope that things will get better. Her goal is to give people hope. And hope is the most important thing people can have. If I think about the overwhelming nature of the problem, it's so much easier not to do anything. And there's a lot of people that say the problem is so big, nothing we can do will ever fix it. Well, if we all took that position, then nothing would ever get done. And Sasha, you left the Central Valley job four years ago. You've been at the California Report magazine ever since. How have you and your team, as a team, worked to transform the show? You know, recently we took a survey of our listeners and people said to us that the California Report morning report is kind of like my cup of coffee in the morning with the news I need to know. And the magazine show is more like my glass of wine with my feet on the weekends. <laughs> so um, I think that's, you know, kind of what we're trying to do is transform the, the weekend magazine show into more of a deep dive show. We've been doing a lot more documentary work. Um, I'm particularly proud of a couple of recent documentaries we've done. We did one about Jonestown, uh, the massacre in Guyana in the 70s, and one California man's quest to figure out how his own family's story was linked to that horrible tragedy. Uh, we've also done a lot of accountability journalism through our documentaries. We just did one about how senior citizens are vulnerable to wildfire, uh, seniors in care facilities, and a documentary that just came out last week uh, that was following a transgender asylum seeker, a story that I did. Uh, we reported it in three countries over two years following her journey towards her California dream.
Yeah, and I remember that that story because I had recently arrived at the California Report, and I think I might have been here for a month or two at that point, and you called me up because you needed a shotgun microphone, actually, because I was just coming back from Tijuana, and you were on your way down. Um, and it was just so amazing this weekend to hear that story and realize this is the kind of work that you were doing uh, during just a couple days that you were down there. Um, very impactful, very powerful piece of journalism. And I think it's really important also to just let people know that you will spend months and sometimes years, in that case, two years, on some of the work that you do. Yeah, it's a very different metabolism than the morning news service. But I mean, we do do some quicker turnaround stuff. Um, sometimes some of our most joyful stories are things that are a little bit shorter. Like for example, we do a hidden gem series every year where we try to point out secret spots to Californians, places you might not otherwise know about that you might want to visit on a road trip if we ever get to take a road trip again. Uh, we did a series on California place names like Zizix and uh, Volcano and unusual place names like that. Uh, one on letters to my California dreamer where some of you, our listeners, wrote letters to the first person in your family who came to California with a dream. And then we're also doing shows about whole regions of the state. Like we did a special on Coachella, the real Coachella, not the music festival, but the real community that lives there year round. Yeah. So we do have a couple of audience questions. I'm going to start with one from Rupi Singh, who asks uh, you, she knows that you are from here. You are a California story in so many ways, born of an Indian father and American mother. And she wants you to tell her a little bit about, and all of us, a little bit about your life story. Oh my gosh. Well, I am such a Californian because I was born in LA. My parents actually came to LA because uh, they both wanted to go to UCLA. My dad was a foreign student from India. My mom was an Irish Catholic, is an Irish Catholic from Boston. And uh, I think they also wanted to come to a place where, you know, at the time, uh, uh, interracial marriage was still illegal in my mom's home state of Virginia. She's also from Boston, but um, Virginia was where her parents were living at the time. And anyway, they wanted to come and be in a place that felt more open. Um, and they settled in, in LA, they've been there ever since. And of course, I've spent lots of time in the Central Valley and also um, in the Bay Area. And I think, you know, now I see all these kids with my pedigree, you know, all these Indian engineers who've come and, and, and married uh, white women. But at the time, it was a pretty unusual mix. And growing up, you know, I definitely gravitated to those few people who also had um, my heritage. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really interesting, Lily, that we all bring that pedigree to our, our jobs as hosts on the show. You're also the child of immigrants. Saul is as well. Um, and I think we really do bring that sensibility to our coverage. Yes, absolutely. And um, very good choice, UCLA, uh, on behalf of myself and Saul, both Bruins. We're going to do an eight clap later. Um, Victor Madrigal has another audience question. He wants to know, uh, what is the fundamental change that you hope to see in 10 to 15 years in how media covers our state? Wow. I mean, honestly, I think it's something that we're working on more as a show. I think turning over the microphone so that folks can tell their own stories, uh, making that technology more accessible to people, and certainly making sure that young people and non-English speakers and folks who may not have the privileged backgrounds of many public radio listeners, uh, you know, become the primary storytellers and, and therefore also become part of our audience. And we're going to be asking this next question of everyone tonight. Um, want to know either a, a special California spot that has meaning to you or an only in California experience? Oh, my gosh. Well, OK, since I just gave away my L.A. background, <laughs> um, I grew up near LAX, like right under the flight path of LAX. I would say my only in California experience is in the wintertime sledding at Dockweiler Beach while the planes are taking off from LAX, getting a piece of cardboard or a sled and just sliding down the sand dunes. That is a really mm. good growing up experience. It's so great. Well, the story of how you got your start as the California Reports Fresno Bureau Chief involves one of this evening's special guests. So I'm gonna let you take it from here, Sasha. That's right. I wouldn't have gotten my start on the show if it weren't for a phone call from our next guest, someone whose voice those of you who listen to NPR regularly will definitely recognize Tamara Keith, who is the White House correspondent from NPR, and she joins us now from her home 
uh, near DC after a very long day, I understand, following Joe Biden. Tam? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, I got my job on the California Report because you enticed me. You were the Central Valley Bureau reporter before me, and you you know, told me about these stories covering cow poop and farmers who feel like consumers don't understand their plight. And you were from Hanford. You grew up in the Central Valley, and you, and you went back there to report on your home turf. Absolutely, um, and learned a lot about my home turf in the process. Um, it was, uh, you know, my first reporting job out of college, out of grad school, and um, I don't think, you know, as I give young people advice about what they should do, you know, how to get started in our industry, I'm always like, you know, go to a place like the Central Valley where there are so many amazing stories stories and and just like you experienced there there weren't we the area w it was not crawling with public radio reporters um i basically could choose any story i wanted to tell um and there were so many awesome incredible stories that i mean the the kind of reporting that i did when i was in the valley i mean it was it was formative in helping me become a better journalist um and also I don't know in in the rest of my career that I've ever um, had such an opportunity to meet so many incredible people as I did uh, covering the Valley. Wow. Well, we should say you actually- I got mean, I should say I cover politics now, so it's like completely different. Right, so, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, there's a dearth of incredible people. Um, you, we should say, Tam, though, that you were kind of a child prodigy. I mean, you got your start on the California Report when you were like 12, right? No, Something I was like 18. Okay, well, we want to take a minute to play Tamara's first radio essay for the California Report. Get ready to, to be embarrassed, Tam. <laughs> the transition from teen to adult is often an awkward experience. For some thoughts about that, we turn now to a young California writer, Tamara Keith. When I was a little girl, I had a pair of huge silver high heels in my closet. I'm sure my mom had once worn them to a fancy dinner or a special dance, but my wearings were never quite so glamorous. Every once in a while, I slapped on some fuchsia Tinkerbell lipstick, put on one of my mother's fancy nightgowns that I thought were Cinderella dresses, slipped my feet into the massive shoes, and walked around the house pretending I was an adult. Although I felt all grown up with my pink lips and fancy clothes, I know I must have looked pretty silly. The shoes extended several inches beyond my heels. I was virtually drowning in the dresses, and my grandmother said the lipstick made me look like a tart. Over the past few weeks, I have found myself in several situations where I had to pretend to be an adult. Since turning 18 isn't an automatic ticket to maturity, I had to transform my teenagerly appearance, mannerisms, and vocabulary. On one occasion, my ragged jeans, tank top, and floppy sweater were replaced by a slinky black dress. My simple silver stud earrings became dangling jewels, and I actually curled my hair. I had to stand up straight, smile a lot, hold my wine glass filled with mineral water in just the right way, and attempt to remove the word like from everything I said. Although I wasn't swimming in my dress or flopping around in my shoes, they just didn't feel quite right. My body may have fit into those clothes, but it wasn't me. At least not yet. Adulthood is as much cosmetic as chronological. At some point, the mature part of the soul overwhelms the child. I guess, until I become a real grown-up, I can just pretend. For all I know, that could be what everyone else is doing, too. Tamara Keith is a student majoring in philosophy at UC Berkeley. If you... From there to the White House, folks. Tamara, I love that picture of you with the little toddler microphone. I have no idea what that was. It was like, you know, early, early karaoke machine. <laughs> I just want to remind our audience, if you have a question for Tamara Keith, feel free to submit it in the chat. Tam, you, of course, went on from doing that essay to being a big part of our show. You did the early morning shifts as the director of the California Report. You also covered Sacramento. 
Any favorite or funny behind the scenes moments you want to share with us? I don't know if it's fun. Well, okay. There's one I can think of that is funny. The The thing that really stands out to me is, you know, like I volunteered to be an intern who wasn't paid doing that early morning shift every single day. And, you know, the reason I did that was in part so I could spend time with Scott Schaefer um, and so that I could have sort of unobstructed time to learn uh, before everyone else came into the office. And Scott and I would go basically every morning, I think this is, I gained like 20 pounds. We would go get coffee and scones or tea and scones every morning and chat. And I learned so much uh, from that. Uh, the, <laughs> the the thing that is funny is the time that I uh, overslept my alarm. I mean, it's funny now. Uh, I overslept my alarm maybe had been sleeping at my boyfriend's house, maybe didn't have regular normal clothes and had to race across the Bay Bridge wearing gym clothes and then work an entire day wearing gym clothes <laughs> at the California report, which is kind of an embarrassment. Uh, the other one is, uh, and this is less funny though, in, you know, with 20 years behind us, it's okay. Um, we, uh, there was an execution and Kai Rizdal did this amazing story about the execution. Um, and, um, the, the person who, um, was, uh, you know, convicted and, and then died with a, with a feather on his chest, moving up and down as you saw his breath end. It's just this incredible story that he did. Uh, and I picked a piece of music to go after it that, you know, in my filing system just said 10 seconds, sad song. Um, it turns out the song was called Better Off Dead. Oh my God. <laughs> and I had no idea, but the listeners knew and and wondered if I was trying to be funny. It was mortifying. It was terrible. But, um, you know, 20 years later, it's actually pretty funny. Oh, my God. Well, I have to ask you, how do you think your time on the California Report has prepared you for your job today covering the Trump administration? I mean, anything from the farm fields of Fresno that brought you to the press room of the White House? Well, so I guess one thing is that working on the California report taught me how to be an audio journalist. Uh, and and Seal Muller, as we've talked about, just taught a master class in how to make audio journalism, which I don't get to use every day covering this White House. Um, I will say that, you know, when when people talk about real America, I think I'm from real America. I'm I'm from the Central Valley of California. Like, don't talk to me about real America. I'm from real California. Um, and uh, I, and I think that I uh, can relate uh, in a way that people probably wouldn't assume that one could uh, if you just say you're from California. So what happens January 20th? Do you stay covering the White House with the new administration? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, and uh, I, I started covering the White House in the Obama administration for the last two years, which were kind of boring, and I was mostly on the campaign. And now um, I covered all four years of Trump, and uh, and now I'm going to cover Biden. I don't know how long, um, but I, I will be the president of the White House Correspondents Association in 2022 and 2023. So I know that I will continue to be a White House correspondent at least until then. <laughs> wow. Okay. I got to ask you, because I'm sure you are homesick for California, especially in December in Washington, D.C. But what is your one special California spot or only in California experience? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, in the Central Valley, but also in Glendale in Southern California. And um, I would love more than anything to be able to take my little kids riding those ponies in Griffith Park. Um, that That is just a really special memory to me. Uh, I'd like to take my kids to get Jalisco burritos in Hanford and Superior Dairy ice cream and uh, to, uh, you know, go go for a hike in the Berkeley Hills. And maybe someday we'll get back out there. <laughs> oh, superior dairy in Hanford, best ice cream ever. Um, we do have an audience question before we wrap, Tam. Um, who would you most like to interview in 2021? Uh, I mean, I would like to interview the president of the United States in 2021. I mean, that's kind of, uh, you know, every year. Um, 
And and also, I'd still like to interview Donald Trump. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> uh, you know, other than I have perfected shouting over aircraft, but I would love to do an actual interview. Um, and, and, you know, what I really aspire to is interviewing regular people affected by policy, um, because I think you know, the biggest challenge of my job is sort of the disconnect between politics and humanity. And my goal for 2021 and 2022 is to bring those things closer together. Tam, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know it's late for you. I know you got two little kids at home. I don't know how you do it all. <laughs> but you are still part of the California Report family. And it's so, so great to see you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, along with NPR all-stars like Tam, there are so many other people who have contributed to the California Report over the last quarter century. Here are just some of them. Hi, everybody. Wow, 25 years. Do I feel old? But congratulations. It is no small thing to keep a news magazine going that long. And you turned what was once just a dream into a great success. And I remember that dream. I remember talking to Joanne Wallace years and years ago in her office on 8th Street about the idea of a statewide news magazine. Others had tried to do it. It was very difficult. And I said, we can do this. We should just do this. And she said, Sally, we need the money. And the station got the money and the rest is history. And I have such incredible memories of working on that show. I got to be the founding senior producer and I remember show day rushing in with great stacks of reels of tape and Seal Muller behind the board like Oz working her magic with the pots and the sliders and Tammy Ray Scott directing it all like a maestro. And then it was over and we'd all go to the slow club and talk about the next week. It was one of my best jobs ever. And I am so proud to have played even a small role in what you've done with it today. I couldn't be happier for you all. And I wish you all the very best for the next 25. Hey, this is Elsa Chang from NPR. And I used to be an intern at the California Report back in 2006. I had just quit being a lawyer, was desperate to learn how to make radio. And I, wrote my first piece at the California Report as an intern. Um, it was the story about a place called Pie Ranch where high school kids would go to learn how to grow and cultivate fresh ingredients for pies, make those pies, and then learn how to sell those pies. And it was my first field reporting experience. I remember going out there and recording people walking through grass for the first time in my life and getting the noises of animals and getting all the chopping and the rolling out of the dough. It was so much fun. And I remember coming back with all the sound and I was just like, okay, now how do you write a radio story? And Victoria Malion, I remember she like sat down next to me and just went through my script line by line. It was so painstaking because I didn't realize how different writing for radio was from writing as a lawyer. And Victoria just went through the entire script so meticulously, taught me different ways to write in and out of tape. I'm just so grateful that that is where I learned how to write my first radio story. Um, so thank you to the California Report. Thank you to Victoria. Thank you to KQED for being the place where I got to launch into public radio. Hi everybody and happy anniversary to all my friends at the California Report and everybody that's listened and supported the show over the years. Wow, what a journey, 25 years. I can't even believe it. And I just wanna say how proud I am of all the work that's been done in that time. It takes a lot of work to do that, a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings. And I really, when I think back on the 14 years that I spent with the crew, what really stands out for me are just the amazing ways that Californians were willing to open up and share their stories so that we could connect this big state. People were willing to laugh, to cry, to just welcome us into their homes, their businesses, and tell us what is really going on in this big state. So 
That really is what stands out for me. And as you prepare to celebrate the next 25 years, I just want to wish everybody the best and say that I'll be listening and celebrating along with you. So thanks for everything you do to make the California Report as good as it is. Hey everybody, it's Kai Rizdahl. First of all, I apologize for the backdrop. This is the little tent fort that the Marketplace Engineers built me uh, in a shed next to my garage so that um, we could still do the show and not have to go into the studio. Um, first of all, 25 years. Unbelievable. Congratulations. Second of all, the fact that I was there 20 years ago is just slightly horrifying. Um, I know the prompt for this was tell us a memorable or a funny story about your time on the California Report. And there are bunches of them, right? I mean, I loved every second that I was on that show. Out in the field reporting and, and um, getting to sit in and host every now and then. Um, but here's the thing about... California Report and KQED and me. Um, it taught me how to do this job. It taught me how to listen for sound and to edit for sound and to think about um, telling stories in a way that's gonna make people wanna listen to them. Um, and it is not a stretch at all to say that if it wasn't for the California Report, um, I would not have the job I have today. Um, so that's it. Congratulations. Call me again on your 30th um, and I'll do another video. All right. Bye. Hi, I'm Mas Masumoto in California Report celebrating 25 years. Thanks for giving a taste of the state and her people, land and stories. This moment is history is about listening and sharing. We've been pleased to be part of that 25 years and look forward to more listening out in the fields walking, working as an excuse to listen. Happy birthday, California Report. So you're 25 years old, which I'm pretty sure is how old I was when I started working at KQED in the California Report. So I'm supposed to conjure up all kinds of memories about stories I did that stood out to me. Um, honestly, you know, I remember a lot of blackouts. I think we covered a lot of pg &E blackouts. I remember a lot of nurses striking. Any of this feel like a familiar theme? Uh, but really the thing I remember most about my time there was the people. And that might sound cliche, but KQED and the California Report changed everything for me, right? I learned how to do radio there from the best. Uh, Scott Schaefer, Susie Racho, Alex Cohen, Ingrid Becker, Raul Ramirez, David Gorn, a long list of people who have come through the doors of the California Report. You guys are the gold standard uh, in terms of statewide reporting. I am so, so happy to be part of this anniversary, and I am I am very, very happy to be part of a small part of, of its wonderful legacy. Cheers. Wow, 25. Awesome. Um, yeah, I learned a lot from the California Report. I was fresh off an internship with KQED News and um, I had applied for an internship with the California Report because I wanted to stay working at KQED. And I just learned so much from working on that team. Everyone welcomed me with open arms. There was so much to do all the time. Um, we traveled a lot just within the Bay Area um, on quick little reporting trips for stories, which I always thought was fun. Um, you know, I loved being in the studio with Susie. Um, I loved sitting in on edits with Vic and um, I loved QCing. I loved QCing California Foodways. This was like the very early days, I think like the first couple of episodes of that show. And I remember I was always like so excited every time there was a new episode. Um, Cause I thought it was really cool. And yeah, um, I'm really grateful to all of you uh, for teaching me the ropes and happy 25th. Hi everybody, Rachel Myro here, California Report AM host for seven plus years in the late aughts and early teens of this century. That was a ringside seat to history in the making for me. I got to introduce all sorts of stories about California, big, beautiful, sad, enraging, inspiring moments in California, stories told by passionate journalists from all over the state. I used to say I got to be the hostess of a public radio potluck organized by KQED. And all these years later, 
I'm still working for KQED. I'm the senior editor of the Silicon Valley News Desk, doing the daily do in the daylight hours, thank God. But seriously, the best part of this job has always been you, the audience, the people that we've talked to and with, the people who make the trains run on time in California. That's you. That's you. What a privilege to have your attention for just a few minutes every weekday morning to talk about what's most important to those of us living in this golden state together. Thank you for helping us tell the story of California for the last 25 years. And here's to 25 more. Hey, KQED and the California Report, checking in from my little home studio here in Washington, D.C. to wish you a happy 25th birthday. I was the Sacramento Bureau Chief uh, when Jerry Brown was governor, which means I spent a lot of time covering somebody who'd spent his entire adult life in elected office uh, running the state after a first-time politician from the world of reality TV had come in and shaken things up. And it was an interesting experience, but I really don't know if it's applicable to anything else I'm ever going to cover. <laughs> Um, happy anniversary. Uh, it's a great show. I love everybody I worked with at KQED. I love the fact that I still work with a ton of people who, like me, were once on the California Report. Congratulations and many more years to come. Congratulations on 25 years. Not bad, but when you get to 75 or 82, then you can have a real party. In the meantime, keep going. You're doing a pretty good job. One name that you heard in those tributes just now was Susie Racho. You also saw her photos at the beginning where she was holding a microphone. Susie has been behind the scenes on the California Report for more than 20 years as a producer, director, sometimes as a reporter. And she is so beloved in our newsroom because she brings us these fantastic home-baked treats every show day, and she just loves stories about food. She launched a series for the California Report magazine called Golden State Plate about iconic food and drinks that were invented right here in California, and she's gonna share one of those stories with us now. It's a chilly morning at another San Francisco tourist attraction, the Japanese Tea Garden in Golden Gate Park. I'm here with Steven Pitsenbarger, one of the gardeners. He's a bit of a tea garden historian. We are really a gem that's for San Francisco as much as it's for the tourists. He's taking me to the gift shop, where bolted to the top of a display case, I see two small iron molds, black with long, thin handles. They're called kata and are used to make Japanese crackers called senbei. A small sign says these presses date back to 1914. A device, Stephen says, a caretaker at the garden adapted to make fortune cookies more than a century ago. His name was Makoto Hagiwara, and he may have served the first fortune cookies in California right here. Each cookie was imprinted with his initials, M.H. The story I, that I understand is he took a Japanese cookie, uh, senbei, and he got the idea to put a little note in it. You can probably trace the history of fortune cookies back to LA and San Francisco. But, you know, fortune cookies as a concept go way back to Japan. That's Jennifer Eight Lee. She wrote the Fortune Cookie Chronicles, Adventures in the World of Chinese Food. But her research took her to Japan. Around the shrine in downtown Kyoto, there is actually a bunch of families that still make quote-unquote fortune cookies in the Japanese tradition. Lee writes about a woodblock print from 1878 of a man grilling what the Japanese call fortune crackers. They look like American fortune cookies on steroids. They're actually bigger and browner. They're made with like miso paste and sesame, so have a much nuttier flavor than the American versions would tend to be yellow and like buttery and vanilla, reflecting American palate. Japanese bakers still make fortune crackers one by one, much like Makoto Hagiwara did in the 1900s in Golden Gate Park. But making them one by one was time consuming. And as their popularity grew, the Hagiwaras found they couldn't keep up with demand. They outsourced production to a local confectionery shop called Benkyoto. 
My name is Gary T. Ono. My grandfather was the founder of Benkyoto. His name was Sueichi Okamura. Gary believes that Benkyoto was given all of the katas from the tea garden. He says his grandfather worked with Hagiwara to adapt a fortune cookie recipe to the American sweet tooth. They came up with a vanilla extract flavor that we know today. I visit Gary's apartment in L.A.'s Little Tokyo. On the living room ceiling is a giant foam fortune cookie with the message Made in Japan sticking out of it. He drags out a heavy suitcase where wrapped in newspaper are several kata. Oh, those were my duffel bags. They're heavier than I imagined and sport the familiar initials M.H., the Japanese tea gardens Makoto Hagiwara. All right. You can see where a, a cookie dough would go. Then you squeeze it and you can lock it. Then you put it over the charcoal or the flame and, the, and you flip it. Eventually, Gary says, Benkyoto helped develop a machine to mass produce the cookies. But how did this American adaptation of a Japanese cracker become so associated with Chinese restaurants? Author Jennifer A. Lee says there were a couple of factors. When the Japanese first came to the United States, a lot of them actually ran Chinese restaurants because back in the 1910s, 1920s, Americans were not eating sushi, right? Sushi, raw fish, like no-go. So instead, you had um, Japanese opening Chinese restaurants because that was familiar with like chop suey and chow mein and egg foo young. And in this mix of... Japanese families opening uh, Chinese restaurants, they began serving fortune cookies as a form of dessert. So Japanese bakeries in California, like Ben Kyoto, manufactured fortune cookies for decades, until 1942, when Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. Behind them, they left shops and homes they had occupied for many years. Among those were Japanese-American bakers who made fortune cookies. And at the same time, you had a huge rise in popularity of Chinese restaurants during World War II. And as part of that, the Chinese started serving fortune cookies and, in fact, started manufacturing them in mass. So I like to say that fortune cookies, the Japanese invented them, the Chinese popularized them, but the Americans ultimately consumed them. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, sencha for two. One sencha? Uh-huh. And two and, cups? Yeah, two sure. cups and the um, tea cookies. I'm back at the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco, drinking tea and reading fortunes with my husband, John. Mm. Oh, here we go. The stock market may be your ticket to success. <laughs> we'll see about that. We've got a personal connection to fortune cookies, too. We gave them out as wedding favors. And like the ones now served at the Japanese Tea Garden, they came from Chinatown. For the California Report, I'm Susie Racho.
stories or topics that really stand out to you? Well, you know, a lot of times people will say, as, as somebody asked Tim uh, earlier, like, who would you like to interview? And, you know, immediately, you, you know, people I think are thinking of somebody famous. But the stories and the people that have always stuck with me, Saul, are the people who just let me into their lives uh, and told me very sometimes intimate stories about what was happening. Um, I'll remember, never forget a story I did about um, lifers getting out of prison. Uh, and there was a, a, a Berkeley restaurant that would host any new lifers who got out. There was a group of men who would get together with the latest uh, person to get out and share stories about what it was like to be on the outside after being on the inside for so long and just to be in that place uh, with them and to hear their stories about what it was like on the inside and what they're facing now that they have freedom. It, it was just really extraordinary. There was a story earlier you saw the video clip of uh, Hanukkah at San Quentin prison. So just so many of these uh, criminal justice stories, a lot of people I've talked to behind bars or ones who've gotten out. Uh, just really stick with me, some of the stories, and, and on the victim side as well. I did a story years ago uh, for the California Report about the impact of executions and what kind of closure, if any, that brought to uh, victims of crime. And I'll, I'll never forget some of the folks I talked to uh, for that story as well. So, you know, it's it's just really those, the great thing about being a journalist and working for KQED is that you get to talk to people who would never really talk to you otherwise yeah. because they'd have no reason to. But when you work for KQD, you have a microphone, it kind of gives you a license to be curious. Uh, and it opens so many doors. And uh, and I'm, I'll always forever be grateful to all the people who've talked to, to me and to all of us really as journalists because they don't have to. You know, they do it because they have a story to tell and we're curious and, you know, hopefully we're good listeners. You know, that always strikes me about how generous people are when you go up to them, regular people, and ask them a question and the amount of time that they give you. Uh, just one housekeeping note I should explain. Apparently, we lost audio for a while. Very embarrassing for radio people to do, but we're back on. I think we're all good now. And the first question I asked Scott was about how he got into journalism and then how he got involved with the California report. And after that, in case you missed that audio, it was about uh, stories. That <laughs> it was fascinating. Let me tell you, it was fascinating. You got, you got the response, I think. So um, and then and then just turning to stories that just have meant, you know, often journalists don't like to talk about this usually, but a lot of stories um, speak to us personally. Right. Uh, they have a personal impact on on us. Um, anything like that during your during your tenure with the show? Well, I think the one that comes to mind personally is uh, is covering same sex marriage, you know, from all the way back in 2004, when Gavin Newsom, who was mayor of San Francisco, began issuing uh, marriage licenses to same sex couples. You know, KQED allowed me to cover that story from the very beginning. Um, and it, I came out, you know, to our listeners. I mean, I was out already, obviously, to my uh, everyone in my life, but I came out on the air. Um, because I had gotten married during that period of time with my now husband, uh, John. Uh, and so I covered it from the very beginning and then all the way through, uh, through the Prop 8 trial, the arguments uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, getting in, getting to sit in on those oral arguments um, from the, this was the DOMA, the DOMA case from 2015, I think it was. Uh, and so, you know, and, and on that is obviously a story that was very personal to me, but you know, one where you have to you have to dissociate yourself and your feelings and your personal views as you're doing the reporting. I mean, I remember going up Sacramento and a huge rally for yes on Prop Eight, talking to the minister of a of a mega church that was supporting Proposition Eight, and you know, you just I think what we all get good at is sort of setting aside whatever personal views or feelings we have about issues and and just telling the story, you know, as straight as we can, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And just very briefly, Scott, when you, when, when, when you came out, was that a, did you put a lot of thought into that? Was there a lot of conversations behind broadcasting, before broadcasting that, or was it surprisingly easy to do? Well, the, re the reason I did it, uh, not that, again, not that I was hiding, but, um, you know, I mentioned, you know, we had gotten married and so I, and I was reporting on the story. So Raul Ramirez said, you know, you really, for the interest of transparency on the air, full disclosure, you should mention that you got married. 
Um, now, that's something that a heterosexual couple wouldn't need to do. But because it was in the news, uh, Raul thought that I should, you know, just say something uh, on the air, which I did. And I did it very much in passing. I didn't make a big deal of it at all. Uh, it was just a phrase, really, that I in a sentence uh, of an answer I was giving uh, to a question. Uh, but I got email or mail. I think at that time it was actually like stamped snail mail, you know, from people who um, had heard it and really appreciated it. And uh uh, so it, it was it was a positive experience, but it was one I'll never forget. Yeah, I could I only imagine what that meant to a lot of people listening. Uh, now, you've interviewed a who's who of California politicians over the years, but you do have a particular rapport. I understand it with former Governor Jerry Brown, the guy to be a little frank, nice guy but to be a little cantankerous. And, and here's a sample of one of your exchanges with the, the former governor. So I was a little surprised to hear that others weren't tapping into this fountain of political knowledge. Well, then the interview started. Well, let's talk about the beginning of you, yeah. uh, which is, uh, I think, April 7th, 1938. Yeah, I have no recollection of that. <laughs> well, others do. Brown questions your questions. So you can't even formulate that question in, in a way that I can make use of it. But I get and the, often yeah. critiques what you're asking before answering it. Well, first of all, I don't think that question is entirely... Clear. And don't even bother asking him what people are like. What are people like? You know, if you ask me, what are you like? I'd be hard pressed to give you an answer. And before you get to the political lessons, you've got to wade through Brown's world of ideas and books. Lots and lots of books. Pepper, he wrote a book called Mindstorms. He was, I heard all this Huxley talk about Zen bones and flesh. Right. Emily Dickinson had a poem, I'm nobody, who are you? One of them is embodied in a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, which I'm sure you're familiar with. What I love about that is that it is classic Jerry Brown. Scott, do you have anything more to say? You know, Jerry Brown is a bit of an enigma. Uh, you know, I spent more than 40 hours with him up at his ranch in Calusa over the course of several months uh, doing an oral history with him, along with the Bancroft Library. Um, and I, this is going to sound odd. I, I swear to God, after all the, all that time, I'm not sure he knows my name. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Brown, he is an odd guy. Uh, he never once said, hey, Scott, how you doing? Any, he's not a small talk person at all. Um, wonderful experience spending time with him. Um, but he's, he's an unusual dude. <laughs> he really is. Brilliant, brilliant politician and human being and just such an important figure in California. But... Uh, not a people person, I think. Uh, many people who know him would say. Just out of curiosity, do you ever talk like literature with him or philosophy or, or Zen oh, or anything like that? Oh, you can't. I mean, you, you don't. Yes. I mean, you can't talk to Jerry Brown without that coming up. At one point, he turned to me and he said, I've got you pegged. You're a West Coast secularist. <laughs> I was like, OK. You got me. You got um, me. Yeah. Let's turn to this extraordinary year that we're having now. 2020 is like no other year probably in our mutual living memories, I think. Um, there's a lot facing the state from the pandemic to the recession to our usual problems of transportation and the housing crisis and homelessness. Um, as someone who's, who's studied California for so long, who's reported on California for so long, what do you make of this year that we're, that we're about to close on? and what it means uh, to California in some greater context. Well, you know, just I think of the scope, the arc of this year, you know, in January, Gavin Newsom unveiled his state budget. There was a massive uh, $22 billion surplus, and they were going to spend it on homelessness and housing and climate change initiatives. And then the bottom fell out, you know. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I took a course, uh, an elective social studies course, and it was just called 1968. And it was all about the things that happened in that year, you know, the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, the yeah. Chicago Convention, um, uh, the uh, you know, rise of Richard Nixon and George Wallace. And I think there's no question that 2020 is going to be one of those years that is going to be taught in colleges and high school classes for, for years to come. I mean, just in terms of California, of course, we've had this extraordinarily terrible wildfire season uh, that we're all living through this pandemic, uh, a very, um, you know, uh, 
election that, that that began with Super Tuesday in California, but ended with you know an all mail ballot, all you know vote by mail ballot, just because of the circumstances. So it's it's I think it's it's a little hard when you're in the middle of something to really have perspective on it. I think it's going to take a while once we get through this year and probably early next year as well to kind of give it real perspective. I mean, I lived through the in San Francisco the 80s and 90s with the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and that was those were horrible, horrible years. And you just get through it day, uh, one day at a time, like we all are right now. Uh, and so I think that it's going to take a while for us to get through this and uh, look back on it and really, you know, make we'll see what we make of it at that point. But when we're through going through it, you just you just try to get through it. Yeah, that that's the thing about important historical moments, right? They can be often very miserable to live through and report on. They are, but you know, they're, it's all about, that's what life is. You know, it, I, I, I remember sitting in the newsroom on the morning of 9-11, you know, with Kathy Barron doing the morning news and watching TV and that plane hit the first tower, you know, and it just changed everything. It changed all of our lives. And, um, you know, that's, you know, it's interesting being in the news business when you're not just reporting on these things, but you're experiencing them as a person as well. Okay, a couple of final questions here at a big turn, big turn from the very serious, serious to something lighter. As we've been asking other people, your favorite California place, location, experience at that place, what would that be? Well, it's hard to pick one, uh, but living in San Francisco, one of the great things is you can get to remote places so quickly. And I just love Point Reyes. Uh, I love going up there and hiking, looking at the Thule Elk, looking at the, the dairy uh, the dairies that are up there, uh, it's just so beautiful and, and yet very spare. You know, there's not a lot of trees um, and, and the water and the, the, you know, the San Andreas Fault goes right, uh, right under Tamales Bay. Uh, and there's a little hike in the park there where if you've never done it, you should do it. It's worth doing. It shows this fence that was split in two uh, in, in 1906 when the earthquake happened. And you can see how much the earth shifted. Um, and it just gives you a sense of the magnitude of nature, you know, and the world we're living in. It makes you feel very small, which I think is a good thing, you know, because sometimes we get so caught up in our own mission gas uh, and our own problems. We forget that we're just little tiny specks, you know, in the universe. And I, I, I find that to be very um, soothing in a way. Well, what a lovely suggestion and a lovely thought behind it all. Um, so our audio went out at the top of the conversation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the audience two questions that I'm going to ask. Uh, one comes from Tim, who asks, who was the funniest guest you've had on the show? I assume that's the California report, but you could pick something else. The funniest person you've talked to in an interview. Oh, my goodness. The funniest person. You know, what, what I will say is this, that funny people, people who are funny for a living, like Mar I've interviewed Margaret Cho, I've interviewed uh, Robin Williams. They are the least funny when you're talking to them <laughs> for some reason. Mar I mean, they're almost like, uh, well, I won't, I won't make any diagnoses, but it's just sometimes funny, how, not funny, but striking how different they are, you know? Funny people, oh my goodness. You, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, Saul, because when I'm asked questions like that, my mind goes blank. Yeah. Um, you know. <laughs> How about it just to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Scott. Well, no, I was just going to say, like, sometimes when I'll do an interview and then the producer, whether it's Susie Racho or Guy Marzarati, they'll say, or Vic or whoever, you are like, well, what were the best parts of the interview? Like, what, what, and my mind goes blank. It's like, you decide that. You, you, you are the, you listen to it with your ears and you decide what's the best part because I'm too invested in it in a different way. That's a terrible answer and a non-answer to your question. Okay, hold <laughs> on. I'm going to get something out of you, Scott. Who is... Uh, uh, say an elected official, not Jerry Brown, a current elected official or former elected official or uh, politician who's just struck you as an interesting person to talk to, who has a lot going on up here and does does more than the press release answers. Who's that? Well, you know, I think a, lo a lot of people are like that, quite honestly. Uh, you know, I think Javier Becerra, who just got nominated uh, or will be nominated to be the health secretary, is an extraordinary human being. I mean, he's got a great life story uh, and, and really down to earth. You know, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of politicians, they play the role of politicians, you know, and they don't let their guard down. And I, politicians in some ways are the most frustrating people to interview because they are so guarded and they, they can't get them away from their talking points. And I think Javier Becerra is a really good person uh, and an interesting one, very smart. Uh, and I just uh, have always enjoyed talking with him. So he, he's the first person that came to mind. Okay, final question from you, and we're gonna uh, move on to something else. Um, 
Victor asks, is there a question or a theme or a topic that you as a journalist would like to explore more of? Maybe politics, maybe something else entirely outside of politics, Scott. Oh, my goodness. You know, I've always been interested in the politics of sports. Um, and I, I think, you know, now, of course, it's kind of exploded because you've got LeBron and you've got Steph Curry and all these uh, superstars who are really getting involved in politics. But I've always thought, uh, you know, even before Colin Kaepernick, that that was uh, a really interesting nexus of things. You've got sports, which are big business. Uh, but then you've got athletes who often come from little towns or from inner cities. And I, I think that that there's a lot to be gleaned there, you know, and I, and I also love talking to athletes. Uh, so I think that maybe that would be something that I'd like to pursue down the road. All right, Scott Schaefer, we hardly ever talk. So I've learned so <laughs> much, really hardly ever. So again, it's a lot of it's been new to me. Really such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for making the time. So and happy to do it. Thanks really for carrying it. the carrying the banner for the show. Really appreciate it. You're doing a great job. Hey, dude, I do my best. I do my best, but I'm in your shadow. Oh, All right. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to Sasha next. That's okay. right. Uh, we are going to turn from Mr. California Report to the new Mr. and Ms. California Report, the morning hosts of today, Lily and Saul. It's time to turn the mic on you guys and talk a little bit about who you are and what you bring to the show. And, and where you came from. Lily, let's start with you. I know you came from being a TV news personality in Canada. You were working for Bloomberg covering finance. And then you came back to your home state of California and you are in public radio. What's that transition been like? I was like, okay, Canadian equities and fixed income or California? Mm, I'm going to go with California. Oh. <laughs> I actually had a, a great time in Canada. I covered trade, I covered finance, and Justin Trudeau, um, who was uh, had been prime minister for about a year by the time I showed up on the scene. Um, and, you know, I was happy, but when KQED came calling, it was really hard to turn away because I am such a fan, first of all, of not just public radio in general, but of KQED. Um, it just holds such a special place in my heart. And um, it was just really hard not to jump at the opportunity, um, especially on a show that I have personally been listening to forever. Um, and it's been such a blast. I've been here for two and a half years. Um, and I do get to do business and finance stories here, which is fun. Um, there's so much here from Silicon Valley to Hollywood. So I'm never bored. I can tell you that. And it has actually been very helpful having a background in finance and financial journalism at a time when, you know, you look at California and the energy issues, for example, that are almost always in the news these days. Um, it's been really valuable to have that background and to then turn around and cover a story like the PG&E bankruptcy. Well, you have been covering PG&E for most of the time that you've been here on the California Report. And I know a lot of that was an outgrowth of the time that you spent in paradise after that massive campfire. And in fact, that was kind of home turf for you in a way because you got your start as a TV reporter in Reading, right? That's exactly right. At KRCR or 7R, as some of the old timers like to call it, it's the ABC affiliate in Reading and Chico. Um, and we covered fires back then. I think I started there in 2004, spent two years there as a producer and then as a reporter. And um, fires back then were really different than they are just 15 years later. Um, I remember actually going to to Paradise about three days after the campfire had come through town. And um, I got there sort of at, uh, as the sun was going down. Um, and I was just, I was so struck by how cold it was because when we covered fires in 2004, 2005, it was July, it was August, it was hot outside. And then now you're covering fires in November. And I just remember that very visceral, like, this is just so odd and something has really changed. You know, for me, it was, we talk about climate change a lot of the time in the abstract and it just made it so real for me. Um, but you know, the thing I love about covering everything really, but I'll use fires as an example at KQED versus other places is, you know, here you cover the fire, you're there, you're getting human stories, you're trying to 
make that connection with people and make it, you know, make it resonate on the radio. But you don't just leave the story there. You bring it home with you. You know, on that story, we were talking about air quality issues across the state for weeks. Um, we, you know, pg and &E went bankrupt a couple weeks after that. And so we've talked about pg and &E from the regulatory perspective, what's going on at the Public Utilities Commission and the oversight there, Governor Newsom's role, the legislator, legislature's role. Um, and we have this incredible team at KQED that is doing all of these different angles. And it's just so amazing to be able to pick up the phone and call someone like Dan Brecky or Marisa Lagos or... Lisa pick off white and say, uh, you know, I don't cover the CPUC that much and just get this trove of information that they can just download in like two minutes. Um, so that has just been so incredible to me. And in addition to covering that bankruptcy from an investigative perspective, um, we've also continued to follow the human story. I was sent by KQED to Tennessee a couple of months ago before the pandemic to see where fire survivors ended up going from paradise. As it happens, there is a cluster of people that landed in this place called Crossville, Tennessee, which has 12,000 people. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things about Tennessee that feel a lot like paradise did 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I think it helps to have lived and worked in the North State to really understand what, what they mean when they say that. Um, but we also do try to cover the lighter side, even on serious stories like fires. And I'll give you an example. So in January of this year, I went out with a bunch of firefighters and at the, it's called the Moraga Arinda Fire District. And then some of the guys from Specialized Bikes, uh, Bicycles, they formed this partnership. So Specialized provided these e-bikes to the firefighters so they could go into these really remote parts of that gorgeous landscape, by the way, which, they, which they're in charge of, to map out the most sort of obscure parts of the, and really hard to reach parts of that terrain. So we're gonna play a story um, that we produced. I think we ended up producing this in February. Take a listen to that. And now we go. All right. It's a cool day in Orinda, and Fire Chief Dave Winokur is in his happy place, riding on an e-bike with a battery-operated assist that can catapult a biker up some of this neighborhood's steepest hills. We're going to take a left here. Probably want to speed up a little bit for the mud. And there are a lot of hills. We cycle into an area that was once full of coyote brush, super combustible stuff that's about the last kind of vegetation firefighters want on their territory. It's an area the chief says would be much harder to reach without the bikes. Two years ago, this was completely overgrown. We've been able to convert it. We're really focused on these areas in the perimeter because if we keep the fire out into the wilderness and grasslands and we prevent it from getting into the homes, then we've done our job. The chief and his crew are working on a fuel break here. It acts like a moat, but instead of a ditch with water, it's cleared a path in the tree line that can slow a fire's growth. They got a $4 million grant from the state to do it. More time could mean more people evacuate safely and give firefighters a better shot at putting a fire out. Locals want to help out, but the terrain makes figuring out surveys tricky. And that's what motivated Winokur to call up Specialized, the Silicon Valley bicycle maker, to see if they'd loan him some e-bikes. Ian Kenny of Specialized says they're like regular bikes, the only difference is that this bike has a really small motor and a nicely integrated battery, so you can just ride further and faster. So it's very similar to you riding a bike, that's the feeling, except all of a sudden now you've got superhero legs. Volunteers can ride the bikes, outfitted with 360-degree cameras and sometimes LIDAR, into places where vehicles and pedestrians can't go. Then the fire department can link the images collected with drone footage to create a real-time 3D map of where fire fuels are building up. Lily, I love seeing you out there on that bike. How did you strap the microphone on? Oh, you know, I had a microphone, one of those fancy Marantz radio kits in, I put it in the fire chief's backpack and tried to rig 
the microphone, but it was sort of behind him. So I ended up using my iPhone, which um, is frankly pretty <laughs> reliable. And I had it on my handlebars. So as I was riding alongside him, um, it was right there. And so that's how I got that sound. Wow. Uh, Saul, I want to turn to you. Um, you came on the show as kind of our, our newest host. You started and went in July of last year. I did. And you are not only the co-host of the morning show, but you are also our Southern California correspondent. So you have a very tall order. Are you also, like me and Lily, California born and bred? Uh, born in San Diego County, uh, mom's from a little village in uh, northern Germany, dad's from an even, even littler village in rural Mexico. Uh, they met in California, so California, ta-da, helped to create me in some way, cosmic way, I think. Uh, educated at UCLA, uh, go Bruins, um, but nothing against the other UC campuses, or USC even. Um, and I got started in journalism Really just a few days out of college, I got a gig at CNN for about a nanosecond, and it just didn't feel right. The CNN job, fine people, the LA Bureau, but like, I don't think this place is for me. Moved over to public broadcasting, the local uh, PBS affiliate, KCTTV, and worked on a bunch of local shows, and then moved on to our national show, um, the uh, the uh, News Hour with Jim Lehrer. And uh, weirdly enough, the News Hour often wasn't interested in California stories, so we would travel a lot to, across the country and other places in the world. And um, got into radio about six years ago when I got a job as a reporter and producer at uh, KCRW, the local affiliate. NPR affiliate. In Santa Monica. Uh, I remember your start on the California mm -hmm. Report. Coast. It was kind of a shaky start. It was a classic California start with an earthquake. I was supposed to start on a Monday, but oh, people may remember the big quake that hit uh, outside of Ridgecrest in 2019. And that was, uh, forgive me, I forget the day, Friday or Saturday. Anyway, it was the weekend before I was supposed to start. So uh, I was conscripted pretty uh, quickly as a new hire, zoomed up to Ridgecrest in the tiny little community of Trona and reported uh, live for the California Report and KQED and then NPR. And uh, that was my start. And I'm happy to say that it was a huge earthquake, but it did not, but it wasn't catastrophic in terms of the built environment. Uh, uh, people did generally just fine. So it was, a, it was a happy, you know, kind of a happy natural catastrophe story if you can have such a thing. You have this huge territory. I mean, you go out to the Mojave Desert, you're covering up to Santa Barbara, I mean, down to San Diego. And I just think of you as this, like, you know, classic guy on the street journalist who's looking for these serendipitous moments, talking to folks on the street. And one thing I love about your work is you always have a camera with you and you're such a good photographer, which is rare for us radio people. <laughs> I'm a decent photographer. I think good photographers would say not so good, but I love doing it. I love putting the the face or the place with the with the audio story you tell over the radio or over a podcast. Uh, so I've been doing more and more of that. And in terms of Southern California, well, first off, I, I think I just know it very well. I mean, I've done so many programs here. I've lived most of my life here. So I have a lot of institutional memory I, I bring of different places in Southern California. And you're absolutely right. I just, I get a little antsy being inside. I I, um, I uh, really like being out and about whenever possible. And I think, frankly, there is no substitute. There is no, um, you know, love studio conversations as well, but there's no substitute for bringing in someone into studio. Uh, you know, there's no substitute for actually going out to people, seeing them in their place, where they're living their lives versus them having them in studio or certainly having them on the phone. But of course, with the pandemic, uh, my world has contracted down to basically what you see around you right now here in my home. Mm -hmm. Like for all of us. Is there a favorite story uh, of someone in their natural habitat you want to share? Um, one of the best things about working for public broadcasting, both my PBS years and now for, for radio, is just the, the really the, the, the honor of meeting people you otherwise would never meet. These are people who in some, often in some big or small way have contributed to history, have made their mark on the culture or on science or on politics. So my the one that stands out for me is a gentleman by the name of Leonard Kleinrock. He's a professor at UCLA. And in 1969, the easiest way to say this, in 1969, he said 
uh, the first proto internet message between his computer lab at UCLA and a lab at Stanford. Um, and we talked about everything, kind of what he really helped to create and whether or not he was uh, felt any responsibility for this world is cre he's created uh, for good or bad through the internet. And this is some of our conversation. You know, 50 years later, um, the internet has done wonderful things for society and culture, right? Uh, those of us who have access to the net have access to the sum total of human knowledge. But there's also a lot of vileness. I and mean, there's oceans of hatred and paranoia on the, on the web, and it's an engine of misinformation. What do you think of the Jekyll and Hyde sides of this technology? It worries me greatly. You know, the internet worked beautifully for the first 20 years. We were all friends. There was no reason to install any protective measures, and so we didn't, and now we're paying the price. It was pure in the first couple of decades. Exactly. I mean, the words we used were open, shared, free, ethical, and all those words applied. That was a community of well-minded and smart people. Now, there are so many voices talking. Who do you listen to? You listen to the extremes. You listen to the most outrageous and the loudest. And therein lies, if you will, the attraction, the seduction, and the, the evil use of the internet. And I do fear and worry about this dark side of the internet as you described. In fact, a bigger question is, can it be fixed? Can we protect against this false information from the fraud, from the identity theft, from the privacy invasion? And the answer is it's not that clear that we can. Saul and Lily, let's open it up to both of you now as co-hosts of the morning. How do you decide what a morning story is for the California Report? I mean, you've got this huge mandate, right, to tell the state stories in like a seven or eight minute newscast every morning. What, what are the ingredients of a California Report story? Lily? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think we, I, I have such an appreciation for um, for this niche that we occupy. You know, we're not doing national news, we're not doing local news, and there is this giant universe of stories that are totally up our alley, whether it's covering um, what's going on, for example, with unemployment benefits, that is a state story. Um, covering, being able to, um, as somebody who's very interested in utilities and utility policy, being able to unify or think through how does what happens at PG&E have um, similarities or contrasts with what's going on at San Diego Gas and Electric or um, Southern California Edison. So we have this really interesting niche, and that's what I think a lot about, is how do we fill that niche? And there's there's so much there. I mean, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, but I want, in a perfect world, for us to be the show of record for the state of California. Um, you know, I want people to walk away feeling informed, but I also want them to be, you know, entertained. I want them to laugh and um, just hear, you know, I think the, the voices that I think Saul is especially great at getting, which is those people, you know, the everyday Californians who just have really cool things that they're doing and funny things to say about funny observations about the world. Hmm. Saul, what about you? How do you, when you get up at that crack of dawn shift, how do you decide what you're going to put on the air in the morning? Well, first I make my coffee, French press. Thank you. I have my little routine. But, but I think when it comes to what comes on, what goes on the air, it is um, really what's important. And you sort of just get a sixth sense for this after doing this for so many years. And then it's also what is interesting. What is it? What is it that is shaping the lives of Californians today or this week or this month or continues to shape or will continue to shape their lives over several years. And, you know, what always strikes me, and I think Lily got into some of this, is that, you know, there for a, a state this size and diverse and all those things we said at the top of this of this broadcast, um, there are very few places where you can actually, you know, that bring it California sensibility to, to, to topics and to stories. And I really hope to do that, that, and we hope to do that, that when, you know, yes, the story may be from the Central Valley or maybe from Imperial County or LA or San Francisco or Eureka, but it echoes through the state. We all have a little bit of investment or we should care about that topic. Anyway, long-winded answer, but that's how I approach things. 
You mentioned the challenges that we're all facing as journalists and as human beings during this pandemic year and, you know, not being able to, to go out and talk to folks in person. How has it changed the show you're reporting and, and have you found any surprising opportunities uh, because of the, the lockdown or the inability to talk with folks in person? Lily, do you want to take that one first? Sure. I will say, and I think um, both of you will agree, this has been the hardest year um, as far as field reporting goes. It is very challenging to get out and get those everyday voices, but we are doing our very best to do that. Um, I do think that just day to day as somebody who's very interested in a particular company, I cover pg e pretty closely, um, you know, they're not a company that puts their CEO up for interviews, um, basically ever. So the only way you get someone like that and get accountability um, from somebody in that role is by going to a CPUC hearing and sticking a microphone in their face or maybe coordinating with someone two minutes before they're about to walk out the door. Um, and and so not being able to do that is a lot harder. It's, it's making the coverage um, challenging, but we're finding different ways at it. And for me, on that story in particular, um, I've done more investigative journalism this last year than I've ever done. I have read more documents than I've ever read through in my entire career. And so I've sort of pivoted from that doorstopping approach to just spending a lot of time on the phone, on nights and weekends included, with fire survivors, um, people who have a stake in that story and have something to say. So I think we are still um, covering it. And in fact, I think we're we're doing really impactive, impactful work despite the challenges and breaking stories that others are following, which is very heartening. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, I'm not going to put any nice icing on this. It is tough to do. I mean, it is very, as I said earlier, it is very frustrating to not be able to physically go out to a lot of places and talk to people face to face. But we're doing it. I mean, we're, we're doing other things. We're doing the Zoom. We're doing phone conversations. Uh, I have a mic in my car that's just like six foot long pole. So I can stay well away from pe people when uh, during those during those times when I am talking to them face to face. Um, and really, I think it's really incumbent on us. You know, we're, we're experiencing a global tragedy here with the pandemic. And from this little corner of the planet that we call California, it is our duty to tell stories about this moment in time in the best way that we can. And often that way right now involves some sort of technological intermediary and we're doing it. And the proof is in the pudding in, in, in what you're doing on the magazine and in our daily broadcasts. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, one of the benefits of, of this pandemic happening when everyone has an iPhone or some kind of voice memo is we've actually found that people are reporting the sound of their own lives sometimes more effectively than if, say, I were standing there with a microphone saying, OK, I want to get the sound of you washing the dishes or talking to your kids or whatever. Sometimes the sound is more authentic because it's being recorded by folks themselves. A yeah. um, couple of audience questions. Uh, do you ever have backup stories ready in case something falls through at the last minute? Can I take that one, Lily, first? Of course. Always. I always, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I gotta say, that is my superpower. I will always have a backup story or thing I've done <laughs> ready to go. It's like a little bag I keep to the side. <laughs> oh, the bag is my computer with sound files on it. And I'm always thinking like option X, Y, or Z. And I don't do any other planning in life, but this is one case where I do much of the shock of my wife where I actually do pre-plan. <laughs> I have things ready to go. So yes, there will never be dead air on the California report. Uh, we will always fill that. And not with just with anything, not just with, oh, we happen to have this. It'll be important, delightful, uh, whimsical, but you will get something of value, I hope. I want to, before we wrap up with you, Lily and Saul, I want to ask you both the question that you asked me, what is your one special California spot or only in California experience? I'll go first, Saul, if that's okay. Um, this is a tough one because I, um, I, there's just so many of them, but they all are out in nature somewhere. So I was going to pick Whiskey Town Lake up near Redding, which is 10 minutes from my TV station there. That's why I took that job. But if I had to pick one 
see what I did there. I actually picked two. But the other one is Catalina, where in the seventh grade, I got to spend a couple of days there with my class in junior high school. And that was really my introduction to the nature and, and beauty and just, man, the state is cool. That was my, that was when that concept really clicked for me. What about you, Saul? Uh, for me, it is basically being any place in California uh, in wonderful light, early mornings, late afternoons. I don't care if it's uh, Los Angeles uh, in the view from Mulholland Drive or someplace more remote. I often love being out, like taking a drive up to the, the, uh, the Mojave, for instance, and just being out in the desert when you see that first, you know, that first sliver of light coming over the horizon. I just, or it could be the beach as well. I just love that. And there's a certain quality to the light in a lot of places in California. I just, uh, it, it just infatuates me. Well, actually, Lily, I think we're going to seg from that straight into some of our, sharing some of their favorite spots, right? Right. So we did ask listeners and contributors to the show to tell us about their favorite spots and experiences, as you mentioned, Sasha. And some of our partner stations also sent us birthday wishes. So we're going to see those right now. We appreciate your in-depth journalism, reports from all corners of California, reports that we bring daily to our listeners here on KCLU. Happy 25th anniversary, California Report. Here's to another 25 years. love to contribute stories to the California Report and we love to have it on our airwaves. That's because California is big enough to be its own country. There are so many diverse communities here and such a broad set of issues. The California Report allows us to give our audience the statewide coverage they need to stay informed and stay connected from San Diego to Humboldt County. So from all of us at KPBS, happy 25th anniversary to the California Report. Happy 25th anniversary to the California Report. We carry the California Report because it brings some of the best reporting on the Golden State to our listeners, from in-depth features to some of the most up-to-date news that you need to start your day. So our listeners love it, we love carrying it, and we just wanted to say thanks.
on behalf of all of the listeners here in Central California, from Bakersfield to Fresno to Merced, we'd like to extend our warm birthday wishes and a sense of gratitude to all those who make the California Report possible. Happy birthday. Happy 25th anniversary. Seriously, you don't look a day over 20. But I also want to thank you for the great journalism you've done over this time and the valuable addition that the California Report adds to the ecosphere of news that we can offer our listeners. So on behalf of everybody from North State Public Radio, here's to another great 25 years of the California Report. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday California Report, happy birthday to you. Woo! I'm Alex Atarang from KCOD Coachella FM where we air California Report on Mondays at 6 p.m. providing our listeners with informative programming about what is going on in the great state of California. Happy 25th anniversary California Report. And thank you to every one of you who sent in a photo to all of our partner stations for recording those wonderful, uh, those, uh, what would they call them, commemorations, uh, and, um, and joining us in this really great celebration. I have to say, one of my favorite things about being at the California Report has been getting to host the show from affiliates all around the state, whether it's North State Public Radio, Valley Public Radio, KUNR in Reno, uh, we've really been everywhere. And um, I've even gotten to report with some of our uh, partner station reporters in the field. It has been such a blast. Thank you all. And yes, most importantly, thank you all. Let me echo that. Um, it's been a, a, a really interesting evening to me. I've learned a lot. I hope you have as well about how uh, uh, KQED personalities and how this uh, show works. Um, and thank you for being, for your ears and for listening. You are really, you the listeners, you the supporters are really the raw fuel of, of what the California Report does, uh, both every day and in the magazine, Monday through Friday and on the magazine. Uh, and uh, I have something to announce. I have the great honor to announce is that as we step into our 26th year, we are unveiling, ta-da, I think it's up on the screen, new logos, uh, new icons for the California Report. So check them out. Uh, they're not in t-shirt form yet. I know because I asked. I hope to get a t-shirt one day. And so if you're looking around to subscribe uh, to the podcast, for instance, for the magazine or for our daily show, just look for the new logos. Um, or look for the California Report. You can find it where you get your podcasts, as they say. And please subscribe. Think about that. Um, again, thank you so much for your attention to, tonight. It's been great. Thank you so much. 
And we'd love it if you reach out and let us know what you want to continue to hear on the show. Your feedback as listeners is super important and helps us shape what we cover. And now, finally, to close out the show, I want to leave you with a California song from another musician we profiled on the California Report, Megan Keeley. It's her ode to San Gregorio, a beautiful spot in California. I hope you enjoy it, and I want to thank you all so much for coming out tonight and celebrating our 25th birthday. Thank you for being part of the California Report. Thanks. Hi, I'm Megan Keeley. I grew up in California surrounded by the vast swaths of open space preserves and state parks that blanket the Pacific Coast. The oak woodlands, grasslands, redwood forests, beaches, and wetlands shaped who I am today on a molecular level and subsequently who I will become. I also consider myself incredibly fortunate to be brought up by a village of people who were drawn to California for its commitment to progress and possibilities. The California Report keeps me connected to that love of learning and to the importance of reaching beyond our own bubbles and understanding the fabric of our broader communities from farm workers to firefighters. To me, California's beauty and progressive frontiers are a state of mind. Thank you to the California Report for keeping us connected this year and every year. Here's a song I wrote to keep myself connected to a little slice of that California state of mind. When your bones are tired, when you're uninspired, when your car won't start, when your plans expire, there's a place nearby, just round the bend. There's a place nearby